Well, well, well. We thank everyone for coming tonight. This is a great turnout. Um, we're still expecting some folks. I think maybe a, a bit of a problem with, the, with parking. But this is great. Um, can everyone who was on one of the buses, either a bus to um, uh, Washington, D.C. in 2014, where it was freezing cold, and that was the Keystone Pipeline rally, or the Great March last September. How, how many people were there? Okay. So this, this is essentially the reunion. <laughs> That's great. Um, we'll, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, we're going to start with some presentations, but before we do that, we have uh, at least I know we have a lot of special guests, but we have at least one special guest who's from the, uh, the office of uh, Councilman Dan Gilman, and that's our friend Erica Strasberg. Right. Thank you. <laughs> first, I think that um, Robert is the first man up. We're going to just run through these. We've got about uh, seven or eight presentations. Every speaker is limited to four minutes. So please, if they exceed the four minutes, I'm not responsible. <laughs> we'll try and get this to this as efficiently and as um, educationally as possible. Is that a trap door? <laughs> 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 it would be dangerous. Okay. All right. Uh, so I, I hardly need to tell this group, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what the world of science thinks. Sort of review that together. Uh, they're really just about unanimous in agreeing that global warming is a, is a serious threat to our planet. Speak up, please. Speak up. Uh, okay. Uh, so we don't have a microphone. Yeah. Okay. Can you introduce yourself, please? I don't have the loudest voice, but so I'll try here. Walk forward. Walk forward. Walk forward. Walk forward. This Walk forward. is <laughs> Robert Mitchell. Yeah. Okay. So maybe I maybe I should uh, move over here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, organizations around the world, the scientific organizations, have come out and said this. You can look at the National Academy of Sciences, the Academies of Sciences, essentially for all the major countries of the world have said the same thing. And there are four key reasons why they say that. First is the, the basic science. The Earth reaches an equilibrium temperature based on the sunlight that comes in and hits and the radiation that, that comes back uh, from the planet uh, out into space. If our atmosphere only had nitrogen and oxygen in it, the planet would be about 70 degrees colder Fahrenheit than it is. And it would basically be an ice ball and we wouldn't be here. So we're very fortunate there's about 1% of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that raises the temperature back up 70 degrees and makes it possible really for us to be here. So a little bit of a good thing. Um, you might say it's like a, you know, Goldilocks whose porridge is just right. Um, so the second reason uh, from the science perspective is climate history. There's 800,000 years of, of ice core records that show a very clear correlation between global temperature and the CO2 level. I think people have seen that in, uh, in a number of places. An increase in CO2 level from about 200 to 280 ppm brought us out of the last ice age and increased the temperature about 8 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And so Goldilocks porridge went from too cold to just right. And it's been pretty much just right for about 12,000 years in the time it's called the Holocene. And a, a great stability in climate and civilization. Uh, third is, is, is climate models. There are detailed climate models now <coughs> that have been developed and really show very clearly that the only way that you can explain what's happened in the temperature in the last 50 years is if you include the effect of greenhouse gases. And they all, those same models also predict that by the end of the century, if we keep going as we are, we're going to warm up about as much as it was cooler during the ice age. So that's that's not a small amount. Some people say, well, gee, you know, what's four degrees centigrade? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> um, the 
the final reason that scientists are so dangerous is, is just the consequences. Uh, we know about the heat waves, severe droughts, and so on. But you don't have to, it's like you don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. You don't really have to be a scientist to understand what's going on. Farmers, ranchers, and fishermen can see what's happening in terms of their crops, their livestock, their catches. Um, insurance companies are facing, you know, dealing with which much bigger claims. The military sees climate change as a, a threat multiplier and something that's going to increase instability and terrorism uh, around the world. So, um, so, let's get that. so <laughs> now on my own. So, let, me, let me just very quickly say, uh, <coughs> uh, in spite of, of this, this, this you know, shared view of scientists and people who, who study climate professionally, uh, you don't see that reflected in public opinion. There was a Pew Research study just this year that said climate change was 22nd out of 23 policy issues. And you know that's, that's very discouraging, but you can understand it uh, if you look at the Yale Project on Climate Change Communications. It talks about six Americas with six different points of view. And the ones that we really care about are the concern group and the alarm group. They, together they represent, uh, I think, 45% or so of people, which isn't bad. But only 16% are in the alarm group, and only about a quarter of those are taking action as we are here. So that's only 4% total, one out of 25. And we need to increase that. We need to get the people who are concerned, you know, that see it as sort of a looming threat that's far off, move those over to the alarm category and get everybody motivated like the people are here. And I, that's really, in my mind, the purpose of, of food fitness. So thank you.